code. You can ask questions throughout the webinar by typing them into your dashboard. And there's a section at the end of the presentation that Beth and her colleague who will present the technical side of this, of how to submit and um, a webinar will go over with you today and they'll help answer some of those questions. And a recording of this webinar is, 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 being, um, is being done and we'll provide that and post to you and post it on the DFSS YouTube channel. And thank you. And with that, I'll let Beth take it away. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, can we go to the next slide? So welcome again. Uh, we are the Chicago Department of Family and Support Services. Uh, we are the primary social service funder in the city of Chicago. So for the city of Chicago, we are that arm. Uh, we have federal, state, and local funds, and we fund programs across a, a whole array of services. And today we're here particularly to talk about children's services and some and and um, some of our programs and funding availability. Next slide. So our mission is to work with community partners in order to connect Chicago residents and families to resources that build stability, support their well-being, and empower them to thrive. Next slide. So like I said, we are um, the Children's Services Division of DFSS, and we administer Chicago Early Learning programs in community-based settings throughout the city of Chicago. So Chicago Early Learning programs, there are some that are school-based that are um, administered by Chicago Public Schools and DFSS administers the uh, Chicago Early Learning programs for children under age five, zero to five um, in community-based settings. As Children's Services Division, we have um, three goals. One is to maximize uh, access for families to high quality early learning programs. Um, we wanna make sure that these are quality, comprehensive programs that meets the needs of children and family. And we want to make sure that there is a strong system of service and we can relieve as much of the administrative burden off of individual delegate agencies as possible. Um, next slide. So a little bit more about our Chicago Early Learning programs in community-based settings. So these programs, like I said, are for uh, children and families, zero to five, and pregnant women. Uh, they're funded by federal Head Start funds, which um, include Head Start for three to five-year-olds, Early Head Start for zero to three-year-olds and pregnant women, Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, which is also for young children, zero to three. And in these cases, we want to have the Early Head Start funding matched with uh, state child care funding. Um, early Head Start expansion, which is a small grant we had to provide some more Early Head Start in community, and state early childhood block grant funding, which uh, funds preschool for all for uh, three and mostly four-year-olds, and prevention initiative, which funds programming for zero to three-year-olds. So DFSS, we fund about 100 direct service delegate agencies. So these are agencies throughout the city who provide the direct services to children and families. And they provide these services at about 350 sites throughout the city. Um, these are everything from faith-based organizations, charter schools, uh, privately owned child care centers, nonprofit social service agencies and the like. These community-based services are provided in three different kinds of uh, uh, models. One is center-based. Um, the second is licensed family child care homes, which is out of a independent uh, provider's home uh, with a group of children. And lastly, home-based or home visiting, which is when um, uh, a child and uh, mom or dad or guardian are visited in their home. These services may be full year, or they might be part year to um, coincide with the school year, uh, full day or part day. Um, throughout these programs, we serve about 15,000 children and families a year. Next slide. So
So Chicago Early Learning has um, several program goals. The first and foremost of these is to increase school readiness. So when children matriculate out of our programs into kindergarten, they are ready and they are um, uh, developmentally uh, ready for um, kindergarten. Uh, so we want to support early learning and development. Um, we want to support families and make sure that families can advocate for their children when they go on um, uh, for, for, to further education. And lastly, we want to support family stability as well. So these are comprehensive programs for children and their families based on the other understanding that the children are part of families. So in order to support children, one needs to be able to support the families as well. Next slide, please. So our comprehensive services um, encompass these content areas, um, education, services for children with disabilities, family community engagement, health services, including dental and medical services, mental health services, nutrition services. Um, we have a whole set uh, of uh, a content area around determining eligibility for programs, recruiting, uh, selecting and prioritizing children for enrollment, and then lastly, attendance. Um, there's a whole piece about program design, managing these programs, making sure that the programs um, are implementing best practices across fiscal standards, human resource standards, program governance standards, et cetera, et cetera. Monitoring uh, data management and planning planning where it turns out community needs assessment will fit in. Um, health and safety, we want to make sure that the staff, the children, the families um, are in safe environments. And lastly, transportation. So these content areas, I should also say, they sort of coincide with the Head Start uh, program performance standards and how Head Start is modeled. And um, so we follow that as that is our main funder of early learning programs here at DFSS, Children's Services Division. Next slide. So direct service agencies, direct service delegate agencies um, throughout the community provide services to children and families. And we fund, like I said, 100 direct service delegate agencies. We also fund what we call support service uh, agencies or contractors. And typically what we're doing when we're funding a support service contractor is we are hiring a subject matter expert, um, some organization or with individuals who have expertise in a particular subject matter so that they can provide us with consultation or extra support in our management of programs and our conducting of program related activities or that they can provide training and technical assistance to us or to our agencies to ensure that they're in compliance with a certain program content area, um, to ensure they're implementing best practices, ensuring that staff have uh, professional development in that area and the like. So really the support service contractor uh, is, is an organization that is providing extra support to DFSS and its delegates in the running and management of the program, um, as opposed to working directly with children and families. Next slide. Okay, so the Community Needs Assessment Support Service Agency. So in this RFP, uh, DFSS uh, is seeking one entity that can provide subject matter expertise and activities related to conducting um, a comprehensive community needs assessment. And the assessment has to meet the Head Start Program Performance Standards. It's in particular Head Start Program Performance Standard 1302.11. Um, and we'll expect that contractor to help us with our community assessments and to provide us with timely and accurate data about young children and their families in Chicago. So as a result of these activities, our goal at uh, CSD is to A, conduct the community needs assessment, make sure we have a good understanding of the needs of children and families and the communities they live in. Um, two, we maintain a community needs assessment website so that data about these children and families 
um, can be used by our delegate agencies to plan. Um, so stakeholders have access to that information as they need it. And lastly, um, we would like the contractor to help us stay abreast of trends or um, happenings that may affect the sorts of programs we provide for children and services, the sorts of um, needs they have, the sorts of needs communities have. Um, next page. So the community needs assessment is a part of the Head Start uh, planning cycle, and it gets used annually by both DFSS and the agencies to um, determine how to allocate uh, slots or seats across the city to ensure that children and families with the most needs are getting served. Um, two, to create enrollment or selection criteria and recruitment plans. Again, this is about ensuring that children and families with the most need are prioritized for enrollment. Um, determining the program models and options and the duration of those services. So we wanna make sure that full day programs are in communities where children need full day care and part day um, are in communities where part day care is needed. We want to make sure that there are uh, family, um, yeah, uh, licensed family child care homes uh, in communities where that's the kind of uh, model that families are interested in enrolling their children in and likewise with home visiting. Um, four, we use the community needs assessment along with other documents to set program goals and objectives. If we know that something is happening in the city, that is somehow going to impact our program, for instance, COVID-19, um, we may uh, want some data and information about um, that trend um, in order to um, plan accordingly with where we put slots, where we fund agencies, um, agencies who they prioritize for enrollment. And lastly, um, the community needs assessment is used to create community partnerships to meet health and social service needs of children and families. We discover in the community assessment um, perhaps gaps in, in services in communities, and uh, so we can advocate for more of those services, or we can also use it to say, um, all right, we know that this is a need in the community and ensuring that our agencies have community partnership agreements, referral agreements with a local service, social service agencies or mental health agencies or clinics or, or whatever the, the need might be. Next slide. So this is the actual performance standards and I would recommend reading it through um, when you get a chance. Uh, it basically has two parts. Uh, one is once over the five-year grant period, a Head Start grantee must conduct a comprehensive community needs assessment. And two, it has to be reviewed and updated annually to reflect significant changes. And you can see under uh, the first section, the details of the types of data um, that is required the performance standard is somewhat broad um, as far as what's required. And so it is to the individual grantee, um, DFSS, Head Start grantee or delegate agency to design uh, the details of how it's going to fulfill this requirement. So next slide. So we at CSD, this is how we have uh, typically conducted our community needs assessment. We um, have annually updated uh, our annual community needs assessment update. It consists of the data indicators, uh, tables A, B, and C. You can find them in the RFP, these three tables on page Eight, excuse me, seven, they start on page seven. There are three tables, population and demographics, child, early childhood supply and demand, and health and well-being. We update those annually and we put them on the website. 
and that we consider our annual update. It gets used by our delegate agencies to do their annual updates. Um, we at DFSS, we might um, do a, a short narrative update if it's warranted, if there is something that is um, likely to impact our programs, such as uh, several years ago when there was the change in um, eligibility for child care subsidies, we, um, we um, worked with our contractor to um, have a, a brief about that um, to better understand what was going on and to provide our agencies with that information. And certainly with COVID-19, we may be doing some um, an update that uh, talks about that impact on our community and on our um, early learning centers. So that's the annual update. So, and then we do a comprehensive community needs assessment once every five years, or as we like to call it, the quinquennial community needs assessment and report. Um, so the quinquennial community needs assessment is much larger. I believe that there is a link to the current one from 2019 in the RFP. It's on the DFSS uh, uh, webpage. Um, typically, the activities that make up uh, that community needs assessment occur over two to three years. So we kind of pace it out. Um, and that includes data collection, analysis, reporting, and then we present it in a report. Um, and it's typically a collaborative effort between CSD and the contractor. Um, next slide. So the previous slide was the uh, our plan at CSD for the annual update and or an overview of what that annual update looks like and an overview of what our comprehensive uh, uh, community needs assessment, quinquennial uh, community needs assessment looks like. Uh, so that's really translated into these required activities from the RFP that you'll see starting on page seven of it. So the first item is the, um, the data indicator tables um, that are required of the contractor. So the contractor really is required to put together these tables, collect the data that's required in these tables through its data share agreements and, and the like, and we help out as much as we can, but really we hand that to the contractor to do because that's their area of expertise. The second thing is to take those data indicators and it's translated into um, our website and the updates on the website. We're currently revising the Community Needs Assessment website, but um, you can go ahead and look at our current versions of them. Um, I believe the link is located in the RFP. So we have the annual data indicator tables. The tables get put online, formatted in whatever way it needs to be formatted so that the, the online database can be accessed. Uh, third, we have annual training. Typically, about once a year, we have a training with our agencies and we'll ask the contractor to come in and talk a little bit about community needs assessment data, about using that data, about reading that data, analyzing that data. Because just as we at DFSS have to complete update and a five-year comprehensive community needs assessment. Each of our Head Start funded delegate agencies, there's about 50 of them, they each have to do the same. Um, so that conference is just a way for them to kind of brush up on, on, on some of that process uh, during annual training. And I think it's two uh, one to two hour training sessions. It depends on how the conference is being uh, run that year and how long the training sessions are. So, for the quinquennial community assessment. So this, like I said, is usually conducted over two to three years. Um, in the RFP, uh, we have a uh, timeline with steps for conducting uh, the community assessment and the sort of sub activities that might be conducted. This starts on page 11. Um, 
this, uh, the first thing we do is sit down and we talk with the contractor and we talk about what is it, how is it going to go? What's it going to look like? What's the plan? Um, so this is really a collaborative effort between CSD um, and the contractor trying to design to bring together um, uh, both of our insights from our different perspectives about what's going on in Chicago and what's going on with uh, Chicago children and families. So um, then we'll redesign the, what kind of data we're going to collect, additional data, qualitative data. Will we do some surveys of agencies? Will we do some um, surveys of parents? Will we do some focus groups, et cetera? And then, of course, also at the same time, there's the annual data that's being updated and the like. And so, so basically, that quinquennial community assessment, that piece, is broken up over uh, about three years so that by the end of the third year, uh, we have a report, we've done some analysis, um, and the, we have a, 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 a comprehensive community needs assessment that talks about three things. Uh, child demographics, just like our tables, table A, uh, child and family demographics, uh, early childhood supply and demand, and three, um, child and family health and well-being. Um, and that is responsive to the Head Start program performance standards for uh, community needs assessment. Okay. In the meantime, uh, number five, policy and work group meetings uh, might occur. So certainly, typically, um, the, the team here who works on the community assessment you know, meets with the contractor monthly. Um, they may vary depending on, on, on what the activities are, um, but certainly as we gear up towards those three years of working on the comprehensive community needs um, assessment, uh, we, we want to make sure we're hitting those monthly meetings and that we're making progress um, um, on it. Uh, and then lastly, additional uh, uh, special projects and reports. I think there is some, um, you can look at the pricing proposal that's included. There's some additional, um, uh, there may be additional reports or projects that uh, we need um, to have completed, that we need uh, someone with subject matter expertise and social uh, science uh, research and, and uh, data, and, and we might um, speak to the community needs assessment contractor to see if that's something that they would be able to complete for us. All right, next page. That was a long one. Okay, now we're going to head back to the qualifications now that I've talked about what the required activities are. These are on page six. Uh, so um, we need to make sure that you have organizational expertise in data collection, data analysis, and predictive analytics in subjects related to the community needs assessment. So for example, we need to know how many children under five um, are uh, living in families under 100% of the family um, federal poverty level. Uh, we need to know that by each age group, and we need to have that updated annually based on predictions, predictive models, uh, based on American Community Survey and, and um, whatever uh, other techniques and tools demographers uh, use uh, to make those sorts of um, predictions. Uh, we need to make sure that um, when you apply that you need to identify a subject matter expert um, who will oversee the activities associated with this RFP and ensure they meet industry standards. So that subject matter expert, um, that individual, should have an, a PhD in a relevant social science discipline and experience managing research projects. Um, in your RFP, RFP, we'd like you to identify a project manager, may or may not be the same as your subject matter expert, um, but this person too should have credentials and experience in social scientific research and project management, and so they can be the main um, point of contact with us um, to make sure uh, activities are rolling along and, and, and uh, activities stay um, on target. We need uh, the we would like you to demonstrate the staffing capacity to provide the research and analysis and written support that we need. Um, 
to complete our quinquennial community needs assessment, and annual updates, to make sure the website's updated, um, and really to address data and data analytic challenges as they arise um, related to understanding the aggregated needs of children and families in Chicago. Um, and lastly, demonstrate the capacity to obtain, store, share, and use data. We need to make sure also that you're following HIPAA and FERPA and any other best practices associated with data. Um, that may include an institutional review board, um, or it may not, um, uh, and the like. Next slide. So on page 12, you can find the performance metrics. Um, this is mostly a contract that is based on, uh, at the end, uh, having certain data, having uh, certain data uploaded into a website and completing activities related to the quinquennial report. So really the, the outcome is the comprehensiveness of the community needs data and analysis presented in the quinquennial report and annually updated. Um, we may, uh, at certain points, uh, you know, dive into the uh, into the website to make sure it's meeting the needs of our stakeholders, um, and also when we have the uh, annual training at our conference, there's usually a pre and post training satisfaction survey. So that's it for outcomes for um, outputs. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that that annual data indicator tables that those are ready and those are um, uh, completed. Um, we have to make sure that our website is updated annually and it's ready to go when our agency is needed. Um, we'll expect us two trainings a year. Um, there are several uh, quinquennial uh, report activities uh, scheduled for each year, and there may be special reports or projects to be completed. Next page. So this is page 13 of the RFP submittal document. So when you submit your application, please, please make sure that you also uh, attach the resume and credentials for the project manager and key staff. So that would include the project manager, the subject matter expert who may or may not be the same person. You'll have to indicate that in your um, response um, and key staff. So we'd like to see um, Resumes is probably sufficient um, as long as they uh, provide credentials. You may also want to include samples of past community needs assessments you've conducted or similar type of work or any sort of documented evidence of reports uh, that involve uh, assessment analysis or an evaluation of community needs, of child and family health and well-being, or of early childhood program supply and demand. So um, uh, that would be great. Um, and lastly, uh, sample training agendas. Um, how would you train um, a, a set of early childhood, early learning agencies in taking community data and helping them uh, figure out uh, who they're serving and, and, and what their programs uh, should provide to the children and families they're serving. Next slide. Okay, this is on page 13, the non-federal match. So Head Start requires a non-federal share. 33.3% is what the city requires. So this could be many, many different things. It could be non-cash donations, including volunteers. It could be meetings held in donated spaces. It could be college interns or fellows, donated supplies, donated space, et cetera. More information about what is reasonable, allowable, and allocable, you can find in the Uniform Guidance, Title II. Um, but let me also say that um, for support service contractors, you're not um, dealing directly with children and families, and so sometimes we don't have the same kind of volunteer hours we might have in direct service programs, and so there is the potential uh, for a waiver for whole or part of the project. However, um, it would be uh, uh, in good faith try to offer um, uh, a means of how you could um, perhaps uh, meet uh, the non-federal match in the um, in your response in the uh, to the RFP. Next slide. 
administrative costs are capped at 10%. Um, there you go, it can include indirect, that's it, that's the cap. Um, prior to a contract execution with the chosen vendor, DFSS will work with you to make sure that the budget is finalized to include those. There is a spot for that ten, for up to 10% um, administrative costs in the cost proposal. Um, and there you go, it's kind of cut and dried there. Uh, next slide. The anticipated term of contract and funding source. So uh, the quinquennial report is once every five years because the Head Start grant cycle is for five years. So typically we try to have uh, the comprehensive um, community assessment ready in anticipation for the first year of the five-year cycle. So our last community assessment was released in February 2019 because we were applying that year for the first year of the five-year grant. So our next one would be uh, due in 2024. So um, I think February 2024. So the term of the contract kind of um, aligns with that. So we will be working over the next four years really on this quinqu the quinquennial community assessment. It may be extended for up to one year. Again, that's because really it's a five-year Head Start cycle. Um, continued support will be dependent upon the respondent's performance and the continued availability of funding. Funding that's written into all city contracts. We're going to make one award for about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That'll be the amount every year, um, depending on the respondent's performance and continued availability of funding. Um, it works on a reimbursement basis only. And that's how city contracts work. So there's no advances. Um, Funding is going to be allocated across four federal funding streams, Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, and Early Head Start Expansion Funds. And should the respondent's contract be terminated or relinquished for any reason, DFSS reserves the right to return to the pool of respondents generated from this RFP to select another qualified respondent. Next slide. All right, so the selection criteria and basis of award. So the first thing we're going to look at uh, is the strength of the proposed program. So please tell us how you will complete the annual community needs assessment uh, data indicator tables. Um, tell us how you monitor socioeconomic health policy issues and other trends related to young children and families in the city of Chicago. Tell us about your experience drafting reports, documenting community needs, and providing training for practitioners in the field. And lastly, describe how the community needs assessment data is used to conduct cell program planning activities. All of these, um, there's questions related to these four items in the question section. Strength of proposed program. Next. <laughs> okay, the next the next section is uh, program performance outcomes and quality. So here we're going to look for evidence of strong past performance against the desired outcomes or deliverables, performance metrics again. So it's going to be providing subject magic matter expertise in this area, providing uh, reports, documentation, and the like. Um, we'll want to see maybe experience using data to inform services and practices or improve services and practices. Um, and then we also want to make sure that you have the relevant systems and data transmission processes in place needed to collect and store key participant and performance data and other uh, related data since a big portion of this contract is, of course, data about children and families. Next slide. Organizational capacity. So we're going to want to see uh, that the applicant has qualified and credentialed staff who will be responsible for program management and delivery. Um, it's like I said, it's really crucial that you submit resumes and credentials that um, testify to that. Um, we want to make sure you 
adequate infrastructure for providing the required services, um, that you have the required infrastructure for monitoring program expenditures, and that your organization has fiscal controls. Um, and lastly, we want to make sure that your organization reflects and engages the diverse people of the communities it serves. Next, lastly, reasonable cost, budget justification, and leverage of funds. There is a um, cost proposal that you will fill in and we'll look at, and then uh, we will look at your ability to uh, your fiscal capacity to implement the proposed programs. Um, we're going to look at the sorts of in-kind uh, contributions you can leverage. Um, and uh, we'll look at uh, whether you demonstrate reasonable implementation costs and funding requests relative to the financial resources of, um, that are required to conduct the activities. Next slide. And I believe this is where I hand it over to Julia Talbot to tell you more about the uh, deadlines and such. Well, thank you, Beth. That was quite a lot of information to, to think about. Um, so that being said, you have until July 2nd to make an application with for this fantastic opportunity, um, or at least interesting one. Um, I'm going to now go through sort of how the mechanics of how one makes an application in the e-procurement system, which is the system that the city of Chicago uses and DFSS specifically uses to manage all of its applications for its contracts. Um, I think most of the people, when I was looking through the list of, of, of sign up, you know, att attendees, most of you guys, I think, already have gone through the e-procurement system at least once or twice, but I do like to do a little bit of a refresher. Um, we're going to look on how to accept an amendment and also how you can tell if you've submitted your application, which is something that people frequently have a hard time with. Um, but first, I'm going to go through kind of the basics of the system. So applications are due on Thursday, July 2nd at 12 noon. This is a hard time and a hard date. So when we we make no exceptions for 12 noon, the system will cut, will literally suck away your application and kick you out if you haven't made a, if you haven't submitted and you're frantically working. And so to that end, I really, really, really strongly encourage everyone to try to submit a day early just for your own peace of mind um, and that you should also understand that in our, our submission we're going to go to the next slide now um, that in our in the our submission process that you really want to leave yourself a couple of uh, you know you, you're, it's not quick you go through a couple of screens when you're going to submit it's not a like a very like that satisfying send mail whoosh and it's gone it's really more like you start the submission process and by the you know and and then you know eight screens later you've actually submitted so it's not something that can be done quickly uh, so i really underscore that give yourself time the application is 12 o'clock if you miss that application the likelihood of us accepting a late application is pretty much zero. The only way we actually can accept an application is if we repost the entire RFP, which means that everybody else who got their applications in on time would have to reapply. And that's that's not fair. Um, but we physically actually can't accept an application. I also like to let people know that we can see you kind of working. And so I can I I monitor my RFPs pretty closely. I can, it's kind of like, you know, a sort of weird city of Chicago version of Santa, I guess, in that, you know, I can see when you've started your application, I can see when you're working on your application, and this has been on the street for a while. People have, I know it's, you know, these are not fun activities maybe, but, and that everybody is always busy, but really start, start early and save often is kind of my mantra on this. Um, 
If you have never done business with the city of Chicago, you need to register into the iSupplier e-procurement system as soon as possible. The, the way that you do that, and there's plenty of links in the RFP document, or if you just Google e-procurement city of Chicago as to how to do that, you, you fill out a form and you email it off to the Department of Procurement and they will between somewhere between 24 and hours and seven days will send you something back. So if you haven't registered into that system, you really need to. Um, as Beth kind of talked about, you know, our process, we build our RFP scopes and from those we align our evaluation criteria and from the scope and the evaluation criteria, we develop our application questions. And from those four, and then from those three things, we develop our evaluation scoring tools. And so use the information in the RFP for guidance in formulating your answers. If you come to a space, you know, a question, you're like, I'm not exactly sure how to approach this. I'm not exactly sure what the answer should be. I'm not a exactly sure what my programmatic approach is gonna be to this. Refer to the scope. Chances are we have direction as to where we would like, you know, how we would like you to proceed. Or call Beth um, as the programmatic lead. She's gonna be able to respond to your questions or, or clear up any, you know, any uh, clarify for you and clear stuff up. But just remember all of those things are kind of connected. Um, you know, like there, there, is, there is kind of a, a, a linearness to this process. So that being said, also select, you know, carefully review the selection criteria because that's what we use to evaluate your RF, you know, your answers is we're going to refer back to that selection criteria and make sure that your answer, you know, grade your answer as to how much it aligns with the selection criteria. Um, mechanically, your application responses are called quotes they're little text boxes there's a 4000 character limit for each of those answers so each answer gets 4000 characters and that ex includes punctuation and spaces the e procurement system very unhelpfully will not tell you when you have exceeded those 4000 characters so we really it will just cut it off you you know cut you off mid sentence really or mid word so we really suggest to people that you um, type your answer into a Word document or Word processing software and do the character counts. The other thing that we've noticed about e-procurement is that it really doesn't allow you to see your application once you've submitted it. So you want to keep a file copy of your application answers so that you actually know what you submitted. Because once that application sort of gets sucked away into the e-procurement system so that we can evaluate it, it is not for some reason accessible to you. Um, and that that's a you know, a really kind of weird oversight. Um, E-procurement works best with Internet Explorer. It's built on an Oracle-based platform. It, um, it, I have had success working with it in Chrome and Firefox, but if you have, a, if you notice that you're getting kicked out a lot, if you have a, you know, the, your connection is not working, the thing is timing out on you, like you're having problems with your connectivity, that I recommend going to the, you know, defaulting to Internet Explorer as a browser because that's what the, the platform was, was built to work best with. Um, that being said, I've been working in e-procurement for three years and I have never once seen this system crash, uh, which means that, which means, you know, yay, it doesn't crash. Boo, if you're under the deadline and you're getting kicked out left and right, the chances are is that there's a compatibility issue between your machine and the city. It's not that the program doesn't work or the program is glitching, you know? So that's kind of, it's, so I'm just saying, you know, we under, we have had, I've had experiences with this. If you miss a deadline because of a quote unquote computer problem, it's gonna be a computer problem on your end, unfortunately. And I've, I've been down that, wrote a few times with a few unhappy non-applicants and it it when I checked the system it's it's never that there was a connectivity you know that the system went offline or anything it could be just a connectivity issue between you you know your your machine in the city um, don't use the back, back browser button on you know the back button on your browser when you're working in e-procurement because it will sneakily keep letting you work but it will not save any of the work and when you go to save it will kick you out and say there's an error. And when you go back in, the work that you did 
when you, you know, anything that you did after you used that back button will not be saved. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so one function is that you can submit your application later and then pull it back and amend it up until the due date of July 2nd. So if you are, you know, if that's how you want to do it, I encourage you submit as many times as you want and pull it back as many times as you want. That is one way, you know, again, not that anybody ever intends to be late, but an application that is incomplete is really no, is better than no application being submitted at all, right? Um, as I said before, avoid the rush and possible mishaps by submitting early. Plan on the submission process taking 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how frequently you've used the system and all that kind of stuff. Late applications will not be accepted. And then finally, there are a lot of, um, we have a pretty good group of training documents, PowerPoints and the like. There's some webinar videos that are on, on the e-procurement site. And we have the hotline, the OBM, the e-procurement hotline, which is 312-744-HELP. You can always call me and I'm happy to help you with whatever your technical issue is going to be. The 744-HELP number only operates during um, during business hours, Monday through Friday, nine to five, they will try to get back to you within 48 hours. If you email me or call me, I will try to get back to you within 24 hours, but I don't always have the, the highest level of access. So, but I'm more than happy to help walk you through stuff or send you things or, or listen to your pain, you know, whatever helps you get through the application process. And as I've said before, save often and please consider submitting early. So can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So here are just a few links um, from the DFSS, you know, from DFSS about where you need to go. If you have questions on registrations, customer support at cityofchicago.org. If you need technical assistance, again, that customer support at cityofchicago.org or the 744 help number. And if you are looking for training materials, a lot of them actually have been developed by DFSS. They're up there. This is the link to that. Um, and, you know, you really, you can always email me or call me about um, about any kind of snafus or problems you're, you're having. So um, let's go to the next slide. I think that at this point, we're going to talk about how to accept an amendment. Ideally, um, our amendments, we do, we try to do one, zero to one amendment per RFP. Uh, generally speaking, the ideal situation is we do one amendment that has the, the answers to the frequently asked questions and we upload the, web, the webinar uh, PowerPoint into the, app, the actual e-procurement app, uh, application. So here we're going to, I'm going to just do a step-by-step -step sort of screenshots very quickly to show you how to do, accept the, the amendment. Um, if you have you know, here we go, the RFP you're interested in has been amended. Please, in order to start an application, if you haven't, you'll need to acknowledge and accept the amendment. And if you have already accepted, the, you know, already started your application, you need to accept the amendment before it's going to allow you to go forward. If you've started the application by accepting the amendment, the um, e-procurement system will pull all of the information that you have uploaded, collected, entered, et cetera, from your application into the new amended template. Um, so if your RFP has not been amended, um, you're gonna, you would just go, you know, you would go to this create quote box in the uh, right hand, you know, the right hand side and hit go. Um, and, and then if you want to, if you're, if you get this warning that's, you know, you can see that you can click on the blue that says the amendment history. Um, and, and when you go to the create quote, it will take you to the application page where you can get started or in this case, accept the amendment. So let's go to that next slide. Um, just so that you know, everything in blue in the e-procurement environment generally means we'll take you to somewhere else. Um, in this particular case, we're gonna, you know, you, your RFP has been amended. And so you're going to begin the acceptance and acknowledgement process, very holistic, uh, to open and so, uh, of the process. So you're, if you want to open the RFP itself, you're going to click on the document number, which is this number um, by the circled one. If you want to just look at the changes, you can also look, look, click, 
click on the little eyeglass icon circled by number two. And that is where you're gonna, like I, I recommend that you, you review the changes. You usually, I have a one page, little like one sentence synopsis saying what the amendment's about. Usually it's just gonna be the FAQs, but you'll see through the acceptance and acknowledgement process that the city of Chicago is very, very interested in making sure that you understand you are responsible for any changes that are outlined in the amendment and that we will now spend the next few slides acknowledging and accepting that you in fact know what the amendment is about and that you understand that if you don't you don't heed to what the amendment you know the information in the amendment that's on you because uh, we're just lovely that way so to get off of this basic slide you would hit the acknowledge amendment button on the lower right hand side um, and you, this will take you to this the screen where you're going to acknowledge you're going to accept um, and then acknowledge so you'll accept by clicking the sort of ridiculously tiny box that I've circled saying that you accept the terms and conditions of the RFP of uh, the RFQ actually as it's known oh here's my little one page like the uh, under there it says sort of like the amendment description that's my little one sentence thing about what the amendment's about it's the amendments off, uploaded as if it's in the attachments as a PDF document if you want to read it and then you're going to hit after you hit the little tiny box check it you're going to you're going to hit the acknowledge button on the right hand side which will take you to the next screen where you um, confirm your acknowledgement of the amendment just in case you weren't sure about it before you're now going to um, confirm that you acknowledged and you'll do that by hitting yes on the right hand side um, and that will take you to the next screen where you will um, accept the confirmation of your acknowledgement. It's sort of like a really, really long, almost quasi-religious ceremony, although, you know, it's not really religious. Um, to do this, you're going to check the other ridiculously small box at the bottom of the, the left-hand side that says, uh, I have read and accepted the terms and conditions the terms and conditions are listed above and then you're going to accept by clicking on one of the two boxes that says accept on the right hand side this is the final step um by this time you probably you know maybe you feel like a new person who knows uh let's go to the next slide so and so that is basically that you've been renewed and rejuvenated by your amendment accepting so you know experience here we're going to go to how do you submit an application so submitting an application, as I pointed out, is not just a simple like, oh, I'm going to hit send and whoosh, it's gone. No, 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 we don't like to do that. You actually, we want you to, to really make sure that your, your application is somewhat perfect. We're going to go to the first slide here. So when you're ready to submit, you're going to start by saving your draft one last time because that's, uh, that's what we all do. We all want to save our drafts continuously. Um, uh or you're just going to click continue because you're just you're you're crazy that way um after you hit click continue it will take you to the next slide where you will uh where basically e-procurement does a little scan of your rfp and it will tell you if you have anything missing and it will do this by telling you and giving you an error message and um then telling you what the error is. Uh, I go through, I'm going through two of the most common errors because I find that the error messages are a little cryptic, although, um, but that's, that might just be me. I find like usually there's a keyword in there that, that is somewhere on the screen and that kind of leads you to where the mistake is or where the missing information is, which is most likely. Here we have the error message saying you must quote at least one line in the RFQ. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, you'll see that uh, in this particular thing, it will indicate that the lines had not been filled out. The lines tab right there is right under that error message. You'll, to rectify that, you would click on that lines tab and then you would just put in placeholder numbers. The lines actually is something that we use, but only at the contracting standpoint. So you can fill out your budgets in the lines if you really want, but we're not gonna look at them as part of the evaluation, we're gonna look at the uploaded cost proposal. So, uh, but you will might, you might get that error message saying that you need to fill out the lines, in which case go and fill out the lines. Um, 
We'll go to the next slide. Um, here we have an example of the errors about an, un, an unanswered question in the application. And so in this case, the requirements refers to aspect of the quote is value is re required for the requirement first name. In this point, uh, this thing, the requirements are the actual questions. The quote value is the answer and first name is the name of the actual question that was left unanswered. In this case, it was the first name. So it will, you know, so there, there's that, that's how you sort of solve for that particular mystical, mystical error message. Um, so go, you fill in your first name, you hit save, and then you go to continue and submit again. So we're going to go to the next slide. And once your application is free from errors, so you hit that, that continue and you get something that, you know, you don't have get an error. Instead, it has this review and submit page, you are ready to continue with submitting. And at this point, you're going to um, click, you, at this point, you're, you're going to be able to see kind of a screen that has all of your answers on it. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is kind of a bigger picture. It has all of the attachments. It's going to have all of your answers. If you see something that's wrong, you can then go back and edit out those answers. And um, this this is just one little bit of the slide because you know most people's applications are quite lengthy and you just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. We're going to go to the next page, or the next slide really, um, and see if when you get to the bottom of your completed application, you'll be asked to provide an electronic signature. Uh, my pro tip is don't do what I would do, which is check the box first because it's the first thing that you see. No, no, you need to put in your name and your title first and then check the box because um, because that's the, what the system wants. If you check the box first, then you get an error message and you have to do it again, basically. After you are done doing this, you know, your application is perfect. You reviewed it. It's everything you wanted it to be and more. You're going to put in your name, you put in your title, you check the box, and then you're going to hit submit, which is in, we'll see the next this in the next slide. Uh, you'll hit submit which is on the uh, lower right hand side and at this point you're going to get a confirmation screen so this is a new feature the e-procurement system will send a confirmation email within 24 hours of your submission if you want to let me if you want to have that confirmation quicker like you just need to know feel free to call or email me and i'm happy i'm very happy to check that for you as a person that worries about these kinds of things. I can totally relate. It's not a big deal. Just shoot me an email or a phone message or a phone call and I will look happily look up that information for you. Or you can wait 24 hours and the e-procurement system will send something to the email address that the application is associated with. So that pretty much concludes what I have to say about e-procurement. Now is the time where I kind of throw it back to Beth, um, unless somebody has a really pressing, you know, e-procurement question, and we can open up the floor for any questions at all um, on about this RFP. Um, Beth, take it away. Thanks, Julia. <laughs> well, uh, right now I don't see any questions. If I'm looking at these question boxes and chat boxes correctly, which Seems like there's only one triangle to click. Uh, my uh, email and uh, phone number are in the RFP as they are on the screen in front of us as uh, there's Julia's. So certainly um, you can call me or email me, although um, I'm in the office one day a week right now only due to the current pandemic. And so it's probably best to email me and we can always set up a, a time to speak on the phone if you need that, but I would highly recommend emailing me. Um, if there are no questions. Oh no, here's a, here's a question. Okay, so, oh, here we go. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Except I can't read it. Oh. Can the policy and work group be attended virtually is, or is in-person attendance required? Well, right now, the city is not doing anything in person. Uh, so it would all be virtual. Uh, typically, um, 
it would be in person, uh, some of them probably, uh, at least periodically. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess that's my response to that. So it depends. Okay. Thank you for asking that question. Oh, here's another one. Oh. Are there any restrictions to be to what can be included as line items in the budget? So oh. the budget is, and Julia, you can chime in here. The budget is a cost proposal budget. Yeah, we're so not doing a line item. Already bucketed out the work, and we want to know. Um, and we've also have a rough estimate of the number of hours um, that certain pieces of work uh, are going to take. If you look at the cost proposal, that is, I believe available with the RFP that you'll complete with the number of how you will, um, how you would uh, allocate the hours across staff and what your staffing uh, cost per hour is. Since most of the work is, is hourly, it's based on hourly rates. Um, so the, the, oh. the restriction really is only, um, there is, I, I guess the only restriction is there is a Head Start, um, you, a, a Head Start uh, federal guideline that I, I think that anyone who is being paid part of their salary in part or in full is, is being funded by Head Start, it has to be under like $174,000 or something like that per year. But you'd have to look, I think that that's something that's in the the small print of the RFP in the end. Um, is there is there a thing about uh, you can't uh, uh, can you match the federal with federal dollars or do you have to match them with non-federal dollars for this? Oh yeah, non-federal dollars. So if, that, if, would, if, that would be a restriction for your mat your match money. You can't you can't double dip on the federal. Right, but the match can be in kind too. So the match can be in kind, space, uh, interns and the like, um, and, and you can submit a, a waiver request as well. Cool. Uh, are, then there's the, uh, is the incumbent firm from the 2019 needs assessment eligible to apply? Anyone is eligible to apply. Yeah. Why wouldn't you be? If, if, you're, if you're good to do business in Illinois, you have a FIN number, and you're in good, you're a business in good standing, basically, and you haven't been banned from having a city contract because you're basically not a business in good standing. We are excited and happy to receive your application. Uh, oh, here, is there a preference for a responder contractor to have community needs assessment experience in Chicago specifically, or would experience from other cities be sufficient? Oh, interesting. Uh, I think it only, it, you know, it just depends on how well the questions are answered and your ability to demonstrate that, that you can speak to data and needs of uh, children and families in the city of Chicago. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, there's, there's not a, if there's not a pref there's a preference for people who can who can provide the scope of the work <laughs> like let's see is there any other questions awesome okay going once okay going well thank you everyone for turning in uh, tuning in on this Wednesday afternoon um, and uh, we look forward to uh, reading your uh, responses. Right. Hey. Okay. Take care. <laughs>